Hey again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and today I want to take you through one of the most basic questions of how to start your own plant business or backyard nursery. And that's the question of what plants, what crops should you try to grow to make a profit for your business? I'm inserting some clips now from some of my previous videos on how to sell plants and you can see that I've grown a wide variety of plants in these videos that I would consider rare or uncommon or unusual in the trade. That's a strategic decision that I came to in my market here. I'm going to tell you how I came to that decision but in part it is influenced, all of my plant decisions are influenced by my local circumstances. So I grow plants in a northern temperate mild climate and I'm close to an urban center which has a wide population to buy my plants. So that's influenced it. I'm going to take you step by step through how I made these crop planning decisions. I am going to start with a diagram. I might even sneak a graph in there somewhere but don't worry I'm going to make it really clear with examples from my own farm. Let's begin with a horizontal line. We'll label this line difficulty. You can categorize any plant you consider growing along this line from left to right, left being easy and right being hard. Those are the fastest, easiest, longest lasting and trouble free are on the far left. An example from here would be marigolds. They're quick and consistent from seed, they have long lasting flowers, and they're relatively pest free. As you move along the line to the right, you can place the plants that are more difficult, slower, harder to find or tough to keep in good condition. An example could be something like Himalayan blue poppy, which requires quite particular growing conditions to grow well. Along this horizontal line, all other things being equal, I'm sure you'd choose easy over difficult. That just makes sense, right? I'd like to add a second line now, this one vertical. We'll label this one line demand. Along this line, you'd categorize the plants you'd consider from low demand on the bottom, to high demand and sought after at the top. For example, at the bottom end of this line might be something like, oh say, American pokeweed. Not a lot of people know what it is, it's not impressive in a pot, has a terrible marketing name, and it has poisonous berries to boot. Very few people will come looking for this plant. On the top end, think of something like fall mums. Customers instantly recognize it, they buy it every year because it's colorful at the time of year when everybody wants color. With both lines in place now, all other things being equal, I'm sure you choose plants that are easy to grow and in high demand, so they'll be easy to sell too. It makes sense. In fact, it makes so much sense that this is exactly what everyone chooses to grow. I'm going to highlight the upper left quadrant to this graph and name it the mass market zone. In this area, you'll find the easiest plants to grow and sell, and because of this, the large growers serve this market really well. The plants in this zone could also be called easy to find. The boundary on the right is where the plants become too difficult or specialized for most growers, so they're not widely grown, and the boundary on the bottom is where demand is not high enough to grow crops in large quantities, so it's not worth the risk for a large grower to produce them. One more note on the mass market zone. Because the plants are easy to find and there's lots of competition, the plants in this zone are relatively inexpensive. In fact, at the top left, these are the plants that are grown by the millions by large growers and sold with very little markup. As you move to the right into plants that are more difficult or slower to produce, the price increases to what you typically find in your dedicated garden centers. This zone may look attractive, but as a smaller grower, it's not for you. Growing and selling easy to find plants will leave you competing on price, and because your plants are pretty standard, you'll struggle to draw the interest of your customers. I'm highlighting a zone on the graph right now, and I'm going to call this one the specialist zone. As a smaller grower, this is where I'm going to spend my efforts finding plants. In this area, the plants are not easy to find. There's not too much price competition, so you can charge a little more and your customers will appreciate seeing things they can't find elsewhere. Now I'll talk about some specific strategies and add some examples from my own market. Strategy number one, choose plants that are dead easy to grow, but a little lower in demand from the area I'm highlighting here. An example from my market would be calendula. These are super easy to start from seed, perform well in the cool season, but for whatever reason, they're not as well known or widely offered as many other annuals where I live. On the graph, I might plot them right here, in the wide part of the specialist zone, just below the mass market. 
Also in this general area would be most of the roses that make up the core of my business. They're not much harder to grow than mass market roses, but they're not as well known by the buying public. Some are once blooming old garden roses, like Madame Hardy, which is lovely in its own right, but compared to modern landscape roses, it's only sought after by a smaller group of rose connoisseurs. Also in this group, have a look at the lesser known herbs, fruits, vegetables, and perennials, which may not be all that hard to grow, but just take a little more marketing effort because customers don't know about them. I grow a little fruit called Cape Gooseberry, which is very easy to grow from seed, but unusual enough that large garden centers don't usually bother with them. On to strategy number two now. Choose plants that are high in demand, but so difficult or specialized to grow that most nurseries won't produce them. I indicate them in this zone here. My first example would be bonsai. They're well known and gardeners love them, but they take a very skilled grower, lots of hand labor, and quite a long time to produce. Another example is in my area, palms and banana plants are not fully hardy. Many gardeners here are envious of that tropical look and would love to have something like that in their garden. Growers of hardy palms and banana plants can charge quite a lot for large specimens, but it takes special growing conditions to overwinter them. Strategy number three is to surf the trends. Even within plants in the mass market, there can be varieties with interesting foliage, new colors, or novel bloom forms. And if you're sharp enough to get there faster than the big nurseries, there can be a good opportunity for you. Think of trendy house plants. Pilea peperomoides became a hot, sought after plant a few years back because of Instagram and Pinterest. If you jumped on that trend early, you'd have done well. It's not hard to grow, really, and the demand was there. Just don't arrive late to the party. Once they show up at Walmart or Home Depot, it's time to get out. If you keep a sharp eye on the seed catalogs, you can also find novel variations on popular annuals, a zinnia with frosted tips, for instance, or a phlox with an outrageous shape and color. And finally, strategy number four is to look for gaps in what the big guys are offering. This applies particularly to those small growers who live in areas away from large cities, where it's quite possible that your local hardware store or your grocery is your only local source of plants. A quick comparison between what's available locally and what's offered in large urban centers could identify some real opportunities for the small grower. One more quick point is that the mass market offering expands in the spring and contracts again quickly after the peak of the season. One local opportunity I saw based on this was basil. The large stores only offer it early when demand is at its peak. Basil's kind of a funny plant in that it's easy to start from seed, but difficult to keep in good condition for very long in pots. In the peak season, I might plot it here on the graph, but off peak, it moves right back into my zone because the big guys no longer see it as worthwhile. Okay, let's say you've selected your crops, you've grown them to size, you're ready to take them to market. There's one more process you need to put in place to make sure that your planning doesn't go sideways, and that's the step of market feedback. Now at first, when you're only growing a few crops, it may be very easy to tell what's done well and what's done poorly. You'll be able to know by which trays are full at the end of the day and which trays are empty. But as you add crops to your assortment and you expand your seasons, you're selling at multiple events, it's important to incorporate record keeping into your into your business and record keeping is not my favorite thing it, it takes time that i could be spending growing plants propagating but if you set up the most basic level of record keeping just writing on the back of a plant tag how many you sold for a day or keeping a small journal that will help you with the next step which is planning your crops for the following year by incorporating some of the ones that have done well this year and then adding some new more experimental crops to your lineup this is my seed crop plan for 2020. Mind you, this does not include anything that I'm doing from cuttings, only what I'm doing from seed. And the software I'm using here is Google Sheets, which is just a free piece of software through the Google homepage, through my Google account. So I'm not even paying for the software here. Uh, easy way to keep track of what I'm doing. It's a spreadsheet that it goes alphabetically by the botanical name of the plants that I grew and that I grew last year. So these are the amounts that I did. And you'll notice that these are all in multiples of 18. And that's because I do them in full trays of 18 when I produce a, a, a plant. And then I've kept track of how many I sold 
in 2019. And then I've used those numbers to come up with a plan for how many I want to grow in 2020. So as an example here, uh, here's a plant I tried out, Blue Pimpernel. I grew 18 just as a trial. I only sold four. It was just no great interest from my customers. And I've decided I don't want to grow them again this year. So I've dropped that from my assortment. Uh, meanwhile, if you look at some of these other ones, like for instance, borage, which shouldn't seem like such a, a fringe crop, but I found that they don't grow it often in the garden centers. So I've grown borage. I did 18 as a quick test, sold all 18, sold them quickly, felt there's plenty of potential to go up. So I slotted them in for 36. Another one that I dropped this year, I thought it looked really good, was uh, Cassia marilandica. I got the seeds, I started those up. I made 36 of them, so I thought I could sell a fair amount. I ended up only selling nine, and so I've dropped that for this coming year. And up here, this Alcea ficifolia, Las Vegas, is something I've seen in a seed catalog, and uh, Fig Hollyhock. Uh, it's nice and colorful. It won't be colorful in the pot the first year, but I think it, the picture tag will show well. And apparently this variety is more resistant to rust than other varieties of hollyhock. So that's a selling point. So it's a new item that I'm adding this year. One thing that's important to note is that with these items that I'm dropping or the items that I've, that I've tried and failed at, this is the only way you're going to know. Uh, everything can look good to me in a seed catalog and I can assume that it will also be attractive to my customer, but sometimes it doesn't show well in a pot. Sometimes it just doesn't appeal to them the way I thought it would or that it appeals to me. And going back to the graph that I showed you, these are ones that appear in this outer zone, but below, outside of the mass market zone, outside of the specialist zone. This whole area here are plants that after you've tried them out, you realize that they're probably not worth the effort of growing unless you're truly a long-term specialist nursery and have the time to sit on the plants for a while and really sell them and really market them to your customers. But on a casual basis or a small nursery basis like mine, where you're just going to the farmer's market or plant selling events, it doesn't make sense. And the real tripping area is over here on the far left where the plants are super easy to grow, the things that grow quickly and easily from seed or quickly and easily from cuttings because they it can be very tempting to propagate those in large quantities and then you get stuck with them when they don't sell. I made a whole other video on that topic which, which is called uh, What Free Plants Really Cost Your, your Plant Nursery. Uh, so I'll link that one up above here. That's everything I have for today on choosing crops, choosing plants for your backyard nursery or plant business. And thank you so much for watching. I'll just remind you that if you have any questions on the nursery business at all, maybe drop those in the comments below. That's kind of what I'm here for.